Ellie had broken things off with Thomas so that she could get away from his controlling behavior, but the breakup would actually have the opposite effect. He became even clingier, and he would start pestering her with calls and messages. It even got to a point where Ellie felt very uncomfortable with this and would start confiding in her friends about Thomas's new behavior and how he just wouldn't leave her alone. Hi friends, welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Crime Corner with Jen. And for those of you who don't know, my name is Jen and I talk about true crime cases on this channel. If you enjoy my content, please be sure to like, subscribe, and to turn on the notification bell so that you don't miss out on any of my future videos. In this week's video, we're gonna be discussing the tragic case of Ellie Gould. Ellie's life had been stripped away from her by her 17-year-old boyfriend, who, in my personal opinion, is an absolute psychopath. So in this video, we're going to be diving into the events that led to Ellie's passing, as well as talking about the aftermath of the crime. But before we do that, I also want to give you guys a little bit of a background on Ellie. Ellie was born on February 6, 2002, and was described by friends and family to be incredibly loving and kind. She was living in a town called Colne, Wiltshire, with her mother and father, Carol and Matt, as well as her older brother, Ben. Ellie had a lot of extended family members in the area, and she was also very close to them, so it seemed like the Goulds had a nice little community where they lived. The county that their town was located in, Wiltshire, was also one of the safest counties to live in. Homicides and serious crimes were very rare here, so you can imagine everyone's shock and surprise when news about Ellie spread. She was studying for her A-levels at Hardenwish School at the time of her death and was very popular among her peers. She had a great circle of friends that she would spend most of her free time and her weekends with. Ellie really seemed to enjoy and love her school, her group of friends, her family, and in general, just really enjoyed her life. She truly had so much going for her and so much life ahead of her. So it's really just terribly saddening and horrifying to know that just one person, just one, was capable of changing the course of Ellie's life forever. In January 2019, Ellie would return home from school and she looked very, very excited that day. Her mother noticed this and would ask her like, hey, how was your day? How was school? And she would tell her mother that a boy had asked her out. And that boy was 17-year-old Thomas Griffiths. The two had apparently been studying together in the same school for several years now, and they've had an on and off flirtation going on between the two of them for quite a while before Thomas even got up the courage to ask Ellie out. Ellie had even liked Thomas for quite some time, but of course, as we all know, high school relationships can be very awkward and sometimes it can just be a while before things can even progress in high school relationships. So they just had this awkward back and forth thing going on for a really long time until Thomas eventually was like, okay, you know what? I'm just going to ask her out. And he did. And Ellie was over the moon. Ellie would then go on to tell her mother that Thomas was from an area called Derry Hills and that he was very athletic and very cute and that he played rugby. Now, the relationship would only last a few months because shortly after it started, it would quickly begin fizzling out. It's been reported that Ellie was very much wanting to focus more on her schoolwork as well as her friends and she lost interest because she was just so, so busy with those two other things. And Thomas had required a lot more attention and a lot more effort than she was expecting. Thomas had, on multiple occasions, pressured Ellie to ditch her studies so that she could spend more time with him. And Ellie was someone who took her studies very seriously. So this really was just a huge put off for her. And eventually she decided that she wasn't 
she didn't like this side of Thomas. She didn't like having her partner pressure her to forget about her studies and to instead go spend time with him when they knew just how important school was to Ellie. Ellie even told her mother that at times, Thomas could come off as very possessive and controlling. And Ellie was just really, really put off by this behavior and would eventually call things off with Thomas. Ellie would end up breaking things off with him in May of 2019, and when she did it, she told her friends immediately that she just felt so relieved when things were finally out there and it was over. However, Ellie would find herself in a really difficult situation. Ellie had broken things off with Thomas so that she could get away from his controlling behavior, but the breakup would actually have the opposite effect. He became even clingier and he would start pestering her with calls and messages. It even got to a point where Ellie felt very uncomfortable with this and would start confiding in her friends about Thomas's new behavior and how he just wouldn't leave her alone. So Ellie had broken things off with Thomas on May 2nd, 2019. And the day after the breakup, so May 3rd, 2019, Ellie's mother would recount that things seemed totally fine with Ellie the following day. Ellie didn't seem sad about the breakup. She was a little bit annoyed by Thomas's behavior and his constant messaging and pestering after the breakup. But other than that, she seemed totally fine. She seemed relieved even and had gotten up early that morning, had joined them for breakfast and then had told her mother that she didn't have any morning classes. So she was going to stay home from school for that morning and then she would be picked up by her friend in the afternoon and go to classes later in the afternoon. Both Carol and Matt were like, okay, cool. Well, we're going to head out to work now. So have a good day. And they would part ways. Now, no one really knows what Ellie did during that morning, but I assume she probably just relaxed a little bit for a few hours and then she probably had plans to get ready to get picked up by her friend so that she could do her afternoon classes. But again, no one was there. No one was home during that time period that she was left alone. So we don't know exactly what went on. But what we do know is that just before noon, before Ellie's friend was scheduled to pick her up to go to her afternoon classes, her friend would receive a text message from Ellie's phone saying that she wasn't going to be going into school that day and that the pickup was no longer needed. However, I do have my suspicions that this text message was never really sent by Ellie and that it was actually sent by Thomas because Thomas would show up to Ellie's home shortly after Ellie's parents had left. And when he arrived at Ellie's home, Thomas would deliver 13 fatal stab wounds to Ellie's face and neck. Autopsy reports would also discover that Ellie had been strangled prior to the stabbings. And before fleeing from the home, Thomas would take the knife that he had used to stab Ellie. He would place it into her hand and rearrange her body and the knife in such a way that to the untrained eye would make it look as if Ellie had taken her own life. Now, I do believe that Thomas had arrived to Ellie's home sometime before 11 a.m. because autopsy reports would place Ellie's time of death about four hours before her body had been discovered and her body was discovered at 3 p.m. So four hours before 3 p.m. would be sometime around 11 a.m. Now, the person to have found Ellie that day would be Ellie's father, Matt. Matt had returned home from work around 3 p.m. to have a quick lunch break. And when he entered their home kitchen, nothing could have prepared him for what he would find. Matt would find his daughter on the floor of their kitchen in a pool of blood, and it didn't look like she was breathing when he found her. EMTs would then be called to the Goulds home on Springfield Drive at around 3.15 p.m. And after Matt had discovered Ellie's body, 
And after he had called the EMTs, he would then pick up the phone and he would call his wife, Carol. Carol would recount in the documentary that both she and Matt appeared in the following memory. My husband, Matthew, came home first and rang me hysterically. He said I had to come home because Ellie had had a terrible accident. I jumped in the car and had all these thoughts rushing through my head. Then a police car sped past me with the sirens on. There were so many ambulances and police cars outside the house that I had to park down the street, and I sprinted up the drive to find Matthew sobbing. I asked him what was happening, and he turned to me and said, Ellie's dead. Two officers sat us in the back of their police car and asked who Ellie's friends were and if she had a boyfriend. When we were taken to the police station, they told us this was now a murder inquiry. Me and Matthew just looked at each other and knew it was her boyfriend. So initially, both Matt and Carol did believe that this was just a tragic accident. Because again, a homicide probably wasn't the first thing that's going to come to their mind because they live in a really, really safe neighborhood, really safe town, and even one of the safest counties. Also, like who could ever imagine someone doing this to a 17-year-old girl in her own home. But when the authorities took a closer look at Ellie's body, they just knew right away that this, that something wasn't right, that this was not an accident and whatever took place here was intentional. There was just too much blood here for it to have been an accident. And the stab wounds, the 13 stab wounds across her face and neck just made it really difficult for them to believe that they were self-inflicted. Now, police had also spoken to the Gould's neighbors and one neighbor recalled having seen a young man at their home that morning. And when describing the young man, the description matched that of Thomas's. This discovery soon had authorities, as well as Ellie's parents, believing that Thomas could be a potential suspect. And the police would begin calling Ellie's closest friends in hopes of learning more about Ellie and Thomas's relationship. Ellie's friends would tell the authorities that Thomas and Ellie had broken up just a day ago, and Thomas was devastated about this breakup. He was reportedly so devastated that he had even confided to Ellie's friends and to his own friends that he was thinking about hurting himself. Ellie's friends also told the authorities that on the day of the murder, Thomas had sent them several messages, just bombarding them with messages about how stressed he was about this breakup and how he didn't know how to handle it mentally. And at some point that day, he had sent Ellie's friends not even just his own friends, but Ellie's friends, photos of wounds and scratches on his body, claiming that he was self-harming. Now, things seemed to move really, really fast in this murder investigation because Thomas would end up being arrested on the same day of the murder, but just later that evening. Thomas would be found in a town called Chippenham, which was only seven miles away from Ellie's residence. He had apparently fled there to go to our friend's home, and when the authorities found him, they found him outside of his friend's house, and they noted that he had several injuries on his body. He also presented a very strange demeanor and was just acting very suspicious. Thomas would then end up being arrested by the authorities. They would end up taking him in and holding him in jail while they collected more evidence. But the authorities were pretty sure that they had the right person here. Thomas matched the description provided by Ellie's neighbors. He had the motive for the crime. And he also had suspicious cuts and scratches all over his body. Things were just not looking so good for Thomas at this point. Now, when officers had arrested Thomas, due to his age, he was 17, so he was a minor, they didn't release his name to the public. They didn't even release his name to Ellie's parents. The only thing that was shared to the public and to Ellie's parents was that they had arrested a 17-year-old male, 
And when Carol and Matt heard this, they knew right away, without a doubt, that Thomas was involved. When questioning Thomas, the authorities would ask him where he was on the day of the murder or around the time of the murder. Thomas would first give them a story saying that he was at home studying all day and then he would ask the authorities if Ellie was okay. He would then later change his story and tell officers that he had actually been dropped off at school by his mother in the morning, but then he wasn't feeling well, so he left the school and took a bus back to his house. CCTV footage would confirm this part of his story. Now, what I do find strange about this new story of his is that he would tell the officers that at around 10.45 a.m., his mother would come back home. And when he heard his mother entering the house, Thomas would immediately go and hide in a closet. I'm not sure why he would have needed to hide in a closet. If he wasn't feeling well, that should have been a perfectly valid excuse for him to go home. I don't know. I don't know why he decided to hide in the closet from his mother. Thomas then tells the officers that his mother would eventually leave and after that he would come out of the closet and he would go over to the neighbor's house and he would ask the neighbors if they could give him a lift back to the school. And when he got back to the school, he would end up speaking with his school nurse about his mental health and the nurse was a little bit concerned because again, Thomas was going around telling his peers and the school nurse that he was devastated by this breakup with Ellie and that he wanted to self-harm. So the school nurse is obviously very concerned and would end up calling his mother who would then go back to the school to pick up her son and then take him back to the house. Again, Thomas does claim that his mother had no idea that he had already gone home once that day because he didn't tell her. And um, yeah, that seems to be the end of that new story that he was telling the officers. The police officers did go and speak with Thomas's neighbors and they would ask them, hey, like, did you recall anything suspicious about Thomas that day? And the only thing that the neighbors remembered was seeing a number of scratches on Thomas's body. And when they asked Thomas about those cuts and scratches, he would tell them that he had been self-harming because, again, he was really upset and he wasn't in a good mental state. So he did use those reasons to explain away his injuries. Now, officers were able to get a better idea of Thomas's movements on that day after they were able to analyze his phone data and records. At around 10.50 a.m. on May 3rd, data shows that his phone, Thomas's phone, had disconnected from his home Wi-Fi. It would then also show that his phone would reconnect to the Wi-Fi again about an hour later. And sometime between 11 a.m., his phone records would show him arriving at Ellie's home and then leaving at around 11.51 a.m. He had apparently driven his mother's car to Ellie's home right after hiding from his mom when she arrived home at 10.45 a.m. And CCTV footage from a bus dash cam would capture him driving this car. Now, after returning home from Ellie's around noon, Thomas would leave his home again for another 18 minutes. Officers would follow the data trail to a secluded area about nine minutes away from Thomas's home and this is where they would find a black trash bag that had been left there. Inside the bag, they would discover bloody washcloths, napkins, and a pair of tennis shoes with Ellie's blood found on them. Once all of this evidence was collected, it was impossible for Thomas to deny his involvement. Officers believed that this was premeditated murder and that Thomas had gone to Ellie's home that morning with the intention to take her life. And do you guys remember how I mentioned earlier that I had my suspicions about the text message that was sent from Ellie's phone to her friend and that I thought it wasn't actually Ellie who had sent the message? Well, it turns out that I was correct. Because at 11.45 a.m., Thomas would take Ellie's phone and he would be the one to send a message to her friend posing as Ellie. 
Investigators believe that Thomas had taken Ellie's finger and a user fingerprint to access the device and to send that message. They also believed that he had intentionally planned from the very beginning to make this murder look self-inflicted. Because again, he had taken the knife that he had used to fatally stab Ellie and he had placed it into her hand. And right after that, he would take the knife and reinsert it back into Ellie's stab wounds, into one of her stab wounds, just so that it would make it look more convincing that Ellie had accidentally stabbed herself. In August 2019, Thomas would plead guilty to all charges but not before coming out with a new version of events. He would tell the jury in this new version of his story that he had driven to Ellie's home because he had wanted to speak with her, but then they got into some sort of arguments and things quickly escalated. Thomas claims that he does recall or he does remember strangling Ellie, but then everything else just goes blank for him. He doesn't remember a single thing after that memory of him strangling Ellie. He claims that he just completely blacked out, but I'm calling BS on this. This guy had gone to great lengths to create an alibi and did a number of things to try to cover up his tracks. There's no way that he wasn't conscious of the actions that he committed. So in November 2019, Thomas would be found guilty for Ellie's murder. But here's what's absolutely disgusting. Thomas would be sentenced to life in prison, but with a minimum sentence period of 12 and a half years before he's eligible for parole. Thomas was considered a minor at the time of his sentencing, so I think this definitely did have a part in the sentencing that he would receive, he was literally just weeks away from turning 18. So the timing was just, it was just so close. In my opinion, though, if you're old enough to murder someone, then you're old enough to face the full consequences of your actions. To me, this crime seems very intentional and very much premeditated which shows that there is something incredibly wrong and disturbing with Thomas. But here's what really bothers me about this case. Even though it's pretty clear to a lot of people that this crime was premeditated and that Thomas had intended to hurt Ellie, the judge would not charge Thomas with premeditated murder because he didn't arrive to Ellie's home with the murder weapon. That was the only reason it wasn't considered premeditated. He had used her own kitchen knife to murder her. And this detail seems to be the reason that he received a slightly more lenient sentencing. To this day, the motive for Thomas's actions still haven't been confirmed. So it's not even 100% clear why he did what he did. I can only assume that he did it because he was upset about this breakup and I guess he just couldn't control his impulses. But how crazy of a reason is that? Putting the murder aside for just a second, this guy would have had to face a lot more difficult challenges in his life than a breakup. People all over the world go through breakups every single day. So to have murdered his 17-year-old girlfriend because she broke up with him after just a few months, to me, just sounds so unhinged. And if he's capable of murdering somebody for such a ridiculous reason, then he should be in jail for the rest of his life. Because could you imagine if something worse than a breakup, like, could you imagine if something worse than a breakup had happened to him? Like, what would he do then? He's already murdered somebody because they've broken up with him. Imagine if somebody did something worse to him, like made him angry or something like that. Like, I don't know. This, I, I feel like he could be a danger to society. And do you guys know what? 
during the sentencing, during the entire trial period, Thomas never once looked at Ellie's parents. He would ask his lawyer to read out an apology letter to the court and to her parents, but he never once looked them in the eye or even apologized to them himself. Ellie's family are obviously devastated by this sentencing. And honestly, I'm not even convinced that Thomas is actually sorry for what he did. Because again, if he really was, he would have at least said something to Ellie's parents. He never looked them in the eye. He didn't look at them at all. And he never once apologized to them directly. He just didn't act like he was at all remorseful for what he did. After the sentencing went through, Carol actually spent years petitioning for Thomas's sentence to be changed and to be increased. She actually believes that Thomas is a danger to society and that he's a menace to all women out there. So she worked really, really hard to try to ensure that he would spend a lot more time, if not the entirety of his life, behind bars so that he would never be able to do this to anybody else's daughter. So in March 2021, the Police, Crime, Sentencing, and Courts Bill would be introduced, and it's also referred to as Ellie's Law. This law allows teen killers to be treated as adults, and anyone convicted could be sentenced to a minimum of 27 years. I can't even begin to imagine the loss that Ellie's friends and families have experienced. And to have it happen in their own home, in Ellie's safe space, that to me is devastating. I understand that breakups can be incredibly difficult. And in, for many, they're one of the hardest things for anyone to, to go through. But there's absolutely no excuse for what Thomas did. And I believe 100% that he needs to face the full consequences of his actions. And while he was considered a child or a minor at the time of the crime, in my opinion, he was certainly old enough to know that what he was doing or what he did was 100% wrong and that it was evil. There's no excuse for it. And it's really unfortunate that he received the sentencing that he did receive. I also don't believe that Carol was able to successfully change or increase Thomas's sentencing period or the minimum 12 and a half years that he's required to complete before being eligible for parole. However, the bill that she did lobby for that ended up going through is going to be applied to all future teen killers. So that does bring this case to a close, guys. Please do let me know what you guys think of this case. And as always, if you have any other case recommendations for me, please be sure to send them to truecrimebygentai at gmail.com. Um, I always look forward to receiving emails from you guys, and I always look forward to reading your comments. So please be sure to leave your thoughts below, and thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate you guys so much, and I hope to see you guys in my next video. Bye.